we're going to be in Nehemiah. So leave your marker in Acts chapter 4, head over to Nehemiah. We're going to visit that just for a second before we move over to Acts chapter 4. You know, it's very refreshing to come back on a Sunday evening and, and worship. When, when, when we move to Columbus, it's a very rural area. And because a great many of the congregation travels quite a distance to worship, we do all our services in the morning. And uh, it was hard to get used to that when we first moved there because, you know, come around 5 o'clock on Sunday evening, you just feel like you should be somewhere, right? So it's wonderful to come back and, to, and, and top off a wonderful day worshiping God together and edifying one another. I hope we can do that this evening. We began in Nehemiah this morning, and we saw that Nehemiah was definitely a man on a mission. And part of what I believe helped him accomplish his mission was that Nehemiah was a prayer warrior. Everywhere throughout Nehemiah, you find these little snippets of prayer that he did uh, just spontaneously to God so that God would, would help him. Uh, some examples are in Nehemiah 1 and verse 11. Uh, Nehemiah says, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now, this was just before he was about to ask the king for permission to go back to Jerusalem and, and survey the, the damage that had been done uh, to the city in chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 for a second. Look with me in verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4, Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, how we, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not, give their, or do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. So he recognizes the dangers and he recognizes the adversity and the opposition and he prays that even if the Israelites don't give it to them, that God will give his enemies their just desserts. Over in, in chapter 6, if you go with me to chapter 6, actually chapter 5, look at verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19, Nehemiah says, Remember me, O my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. In chapter, in chapter 6, the end, of, the end of verse 9, he simply says, But now, O God, strengthen my hands. And there are more. There are more in Nehemiah, but you get the idea that Nehemiah was constantly in contact with God. He was communicating with him. He was, a, as I said before, he was a, a, a prayer warrior. And the text that we're going to turn to in Acts chapter 4 is a reminder of that. It, the text that Curtis read for us helps us to see that there are people on a similar mission. Now, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Nehemiah was on a mission to rebuild city walls, right? Well, the apostles and their companions in Acts chapter 4 weren't trying to build up city walls. They were trying to build up a city, a city of God, a spiritual community, one of faith. And they'd already seen considerable success. I mean, so far in Acts chapter 2, there had been 3,000 that had responded positively to the gospel, were immersed for the forgiveness of their sins. We see later on in Acts chapter 4, were 5,000 responded to the gospel. And so they had grown considerably and they'd, they'd seen some progress in the mission. Uh, but then in chapter 4, Peter and John get arrested. And they are told in no uncertain terms that they better not keep doing what they're doing. In fact, if you want to look with me at, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, these uh, uh, men on the Sanhedrin Council, the highest ruling court of the Jews, said, what are we going to do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Now, that's worth stopping for, for just a moment. They knew, as Nicodemus had told Jesus, that no one can do these things unless God is with them. And so they acknowledged that. There's some things that are going on at the hands of these men that we can't explain. What are we going to do? Obviously, they were more concerned with losing their grip on power than they were with glorifying God. And so it says in verse 17, But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them not to speak any longer 
uh, to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or to but Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you, rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then verse 21 says that they were threatened. I'm sure they were threatened with death. And then released. But verse 23 says something interesting to me. It says, When they had been released... They went to their own. In the New American Standard, which I'm using, it inserts the word companions there in italics. And that tells me that the word itself isn't in the original manuscripts, but it's implied. It, they want us to know who it was that they went to, who their own was. They went to their own, their own companions, their own, their own brethren. And they reported all that the chief priests... And the elders had said to them, why? Why go back to people who are your own? Well, I believe that by what we continue to read is so that they could pray. And I want, to, I want us to see the emphasis on their unity in this. In verse 24, it says, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. They were together in this prayer. They were together in this opposition and adversity for sure, but they were together in their prayer because they were together in their mission. Now, as we think about the mission that we have in, in San Angelo and the mission that we have in, in Columbus, it's worth considering their prayer and what I believe it can teach us. So one of the first things that I see as we work our way through this prayer, is that the first thing they prayed was a realization of God's greatness. Look again at verses 24 and 25. It says, When they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? And then there's more to that. It's, it's part of Psalm 2. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I think it's significant that this prayer begins by acknowledging God's sovereignty. They say over in verse 24, O oh Lord, it is you. And I want you to notice something. The word Lord in the New Testament appears a lot, right? And it's from a Greek word that usually means something like sir. It's, it, it's a term of respect, but this is not that word. This is a different word. It's from a Greek word that we get the English word despot from. You know what a despot is, right? It's somebody who's got ultimate authority. It's somebody who was in complete control. And that's how they acknowledge God. Maybe if you have the ESV or the NIV, it says sovereign Lord, which gives us a wonderful idea of just who they believed God was. And it's really how Jesus taught us to pray. Remember in Matthew chapter 6 when, when, when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Hey, teach us how to pray. Jesus began, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, that means we recognize something about God. When we talk about his name, we're talking about who he is, his identity. And Jesus said, recognize that his name is hallowed, it's holy, it's separate, it's distinct, it's sovereign, it's great, it's wonderful. It speaks of his authority and his majesty. Why? Why begin prayer this way? I think it helps us to recognize, because God is so great, that we are utterly dependent on Him if we are people who is involved, first of all, in His mission. I mean, we're doing this for Him, right? And as they continue to pray, they recognize that He's the God of creation. Look again in verse 24. It's you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. The idea of God as creator and sustainer is an important one. Hopefully it implies to us that since he created the church, the relationship that you and I are in, that he can sustain it, that he's got that kind of power. It's our basis for confidence whenever we consider that whatever God creates, and it is good, and I believe the church is very good, that he will sustain it, that by his power he will help it. And it helps us to realize that the God, of the, uh, the God who created everything will listen to us. In Psalm 50, the psalmist says of God, The world is mine and all it contains. 
Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. Think about this for a moment. The God who simply spoke, and the universe lived, the same God whom the psalmist says, call on me, and I will answer you. Can you think of any better way to resort to ultimate power than to call on the one who wields it, who has it, who is it? They also realize here, as they continue in their prayer, that he's not only the God of creation, but he's the God of revelation as well. In fact, in verse 25, uh, they acknowledge that who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. This is from Psalm 2, specifically here, verses 1 and 2. And Psalm, let's just turn there because it's, it's, it's an interesting psalm and of course it's got bearing to, to their prayer. But let's turn there together, together. Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, David writes, it doesn't say it's by David, but a lot of people think it is him. He writes about the installation of a king and how there was adversity and opposition to this king, which certainly fits the early times of David's rule. You remember how Israel came close to being divided. There were some... Uh, who didn't want David to be king, but those who were of his tribe of Judah, they wanted him to, to be king. Uh, and there was, there was friction there. And apparently there were important people who wielded some power who were willing to fight against the installation of God's anointed, God's king. And so when you read about it, uh, the, the whole thing is all about how God's will is going to be done. If God has selected someone to lead, then that person will, will lead. Well, back in Acts chapter 4, they recognize not only the greatness of God's power, but they recognize the inspiration of Psalm 2. They recognize that, that although maybe that psalm had originally grown from the installation of, a, of an ancient king in Israel, it had ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. They saw its prophetic significance. They, that only speaks of inspiration, of, of, of something that although a man held the pen and wrote it, there was, there was a power that was guiding that pen. And there was something that was driving the fulfillment of that ancient psalm to find its meaning and significance in Jesus. Now, we can know that God's word not only provides us with our marching orders, but it helps keep us focused on our purpose if we keep ourselves focused on it. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, which is a psalm that is completely filled with, with the significance of God's word, says, even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. Would you turn with me to Psalm 119 for a second? This is too good not to look at it for just a second. Psalm 119, that wonderful long psalm that's all about the significance and beauty and wonder of the Word of God has got some very specific passages about its benefits for us. Psalm 119, begin with me if you will for a moment in verse 97. The psalmist says, oh how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. I'll stop there for just a moment. I hope you find yourself, although there are other things that occupy your mind throughout the day because you've got jobs to do and you've got tasks to accomplish, that you think about Scripture throughout the day, that there are snatches of God's Word that help you and motivate you and drive you throughout the day. The psalmist says, I love it. I think about it all day long. He says, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And from your precepts, I get understanding, and therefore... I hate every false way. 
And we don't have time to delve deeply into that passage. I would love to, maybe another time. But you can see how significant the word of God was to the psalmist. And that's the same kind of significance, I think, that we find with these early disciples in Acts chapter 4. Let's head back to Acts chapter 4. The wonderful thing about Acts chapter 4 and their dependence on the word of God is that they not only believed that God's word was true, that it was reliable. I was having an interesting conversation with, with Brandon this afternoon, talking about how he went from utter non-belief to embracing everything that the Bible says. And he says, I did that by studying the Bible, by finding out that, hey, this, this is true. What this says is absolutely reliable. This is a book of integrity. It's not just a wonderful book that helps us to be holy. It's a book that we can trust. And what it says is always for our good. And I think these early disciples understood that. But they were realists also. They recognized the obstacles that stood before them. Let's read again verse 25. In that Psalm 2, they recite it and say, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, we've already remarked about the, the context of, uh, of Psalm 2 and the things that were going on there. The man that God was installing as the king of Jerusalem had some opposition, had some adversity to, to go through. But these early disciples also understood that they were having moments of adversity and opposition. I mean, after all, Peter and John had just been ar arrested and told in no uncertain terms, you better not teach this Jesus anymore. Well, of course, we saw that they realized that they couldn't but teach Jesus. They were realistic about their opposition. In Acts chapter 4, we've already read some of it, but in verse 19, it talks about how Peter and John stood up to the... They spoke truth to power is what they did, and they did it in a courageous and convincing way. Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Well, later on, the apostles are arrested again. It's not just Peter and John, but it's, it's more of them. And they were also told that they better not teach this Jesus. And in Acts chapter 5 and in verse 28, the leader said, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now remember, these were the same people who not very long ago were yelling out, Crucify him! His blood be on our heads and on the heads of our children. And now they're saying, hey, you want to blame us? Well, yeah. In verse 29, it says, Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I don't know about the inflection of their voice or how forcefully they said this, but I imagine that it was maybe not a little unlike how I just said it. They, they were speaking in no uncertain terms about the fact that it doesn't matter what these guys brought on them, bring it on. We're not going to back up. We're not going to back down. You can't shut us down or shut us up. We are going to talk about Jesus. The church was resisted at every turn. You keep reading through the book of Acts and you find nothing but opposition everywhere, especially when you, when you get to, to uh, Paul's story and how he would, first of all, go into a synagogue whenever he would go into a town and, and he would help those Jews connect the dots and the ones who wanted the dots connected could see it. The ones who just wanted the status quo would often run him out of town or devise some kind of way to bring harm to him and his companions. On and on and on, this, this chain of opposition that you find. It wasn't easy for them. And we shouldn't think that it's going to be easy for us, especially if we want to change people's hearts. There's going to be opposition to that. 
Over in Mark chapter 10, go there with me. Leave your marker in Acts. We're going to be back there. But go with me to Mark chapter 10 for a second. In Mark 10 and in verse 29, Jesus said, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Now stop there for just a moment. When Jesus talks about losing everything, we shouldn't forget that not long after he said that, his followers, many of them, did lose everything. What if that were you? What if somehow the powers that be in our country really leaned on us hard about what it is we believe and what we teach and they began to impose heavy fines on us for speaking against sin, for exalting Jesus, for maybe speaking against corruption in secular society, whatever it may be. And they said, we're going to take everything away from you if you continue to stand for this thing that you're teaching. How would, how would you react? I hope that I would be strong enough to resist, but honestly, I don't know. It would be difficult. But Jesus continues and he says, you know, there's not a one who was willing to give everything up for me, but that he will receive, in verse 30, a hundred times as much, as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus says, you might lose everything physically, but spiritually you will gain so much more. Over in John chapter 15, Again, Jesus reminds his followers that it's not going to be easy. And he's not just speaking to his first century followers. He's speaking to us as well by extension. In John chapter 15, in verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. I asked Brandon this afternoon, I said, Why did you hate something so much that you didn't believe in? And I think that's an interesting question. And he explained to me what his position was back then. But today you see people railing against a God that they say they don't believe in. If they don't believe in him, why does he make them so mad? Well, Jesus says, if it hates you, you know that it hated me first. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master, and if they persecuted you, they'll also, per rather, if they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you, and if they kept my word, well, then they'll, they'll keep yours also. And that's hopeful, I guess, in a sense, if you find somebody who is willing to, to take you at your word if you're telling them the truth, and, and they turn and convert to the Lord. Uh, but it's also a little intimidating when you realize that when you're trying to shine your light, when that little light of yours is shining in your neighborhood, and there are some who don't like that light, maybe because of the contrast that it makes between your godliness and their ungodliness, well, you can expect some pushback for that. People don't like for uh, their bad ways to be illuminated. And there's nothing that brings that to the light of day more than your good ways, than the good way that you live your life. And if you are persecuted, if there's somebody right now in your life who's given you some pushback for what you believe, for who you believe in, well, chin up, because you've got some good company. You've got these ancient men who stuck to their guns. Why don't you go back with me to Acts chapter 4. They not only realized God's greatness, they not only realized their obstacles, but they also, in their prayer, requested God's help. In verse 29, we continue, and they prayed, And now, Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I find this challenging because they didn't ask for protection. They asked for boldness. They didn't ask for fire from heaven to consume their enemies. 
they asked for the power to preach God's word to them. They didn't pray for easier loads. They prayed for stronger backs. They prayed that they would be able to endure anything that was brought up against them. They knew that the task before them was, was huge. I mean, Jesus says, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. What? All the world? It's kind of a big world, Lord. But yet Jesus says, go out to those disciples. And they did. They went out. They went out maybe not knowing where they would end up or even how they would end up, but they knew that the Lord had given them a mission and they were set to accomplish it. Think about that. The world evangelized that began with this little band of men in a little inky-dinky Mideastern country. And it's why you're here today. It's why you believe in Jesus today. Well, we may not go out into all the world, but like we said this morning, we've got our own little piece of it. I'm doing what I can in my little slice in Columbus, Texas. And you got San Angelo as your quote-unquote mission field. There's work to do, and we can't do it without God's help. But we ought to plan our work with utter reliance on God's power to accomplish anything we attempt in his name, believing that he'll help us to do it. Look with me for a moment in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians 1. In Colossians 1, in verse 9, Paul writes to the church in Colossae and says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This morning our brother Tristan reminded us of the importance of, of bearing fruit, that we can turn a, a, a dead crown of thorns, as it were, into, into wonderful living fruit of the Spirit. Verse 11 says, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. I want you to hone in on verse 11. Strengthened with all power. What power? Whose power? God's power. Because I'm going to tell you now, you may be a man or a woman of one, five, ten, a dozen talents, and that's wonderful. I hope you are. And if you have whatever potential and ability that you're using those talents for the Lord, but you yourself are incapable of doing anything really significant, you need the Lord. You need reliance on Him and His ability. I want to show you something. Make a left over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, and before Paul gets into this discussion of the armor of God, I love how he begins it. In verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Look, I am so, I'm so glad that you have men here of incredible talent, men who are willing to step up and, and do the work that needs to be done. You've got a wonderful young energetic man in Brandon. You've got a wonderful old workhorse like Q. You've got guys who, who know the word and are willing to, to do the work to teach it to you. But they can only do it by the power of God. And you can only accept it and apply it by the power of God. Why don't you go back with me? to Acts chapter 4, as they wrap up their prayer, even though, let's say, you and I pray congregationally, and we realize God's greatness, and we recognize realistically the obstacles that are before us, and we get on our knees and we request God's help, it's not over. What these guys did after they had prayed was they resumed their role. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God 
with boldness. The place where they were meeting was shaken. And although they had been just previously threatened by the powers that be, they were not shaken one bit. If anything, they were made more courageous. If anything, they were made bolder. I want you to notice something. In verse 29, where they pray that God would take note of their opposition, they say, grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. You may have a version that reads boldness there. Now look again at verse 31. What did they do? They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness or confidence. They went out and did what they just prayed that God would help them do. And when we pray, I'm going to say, as I said this morning, that we're not just asking for God's help. What we need to do is recognize our own responsibilities in making that prayer come about to fruition. You see Philippians 1 there. We're not going to turn there. Instead, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3. Go there with me. Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, Paul himself writes a prayer. It's a beautiful prayer, but it's also a prayer that delicately implies their responsibility to bring it to fruition. In Ephesians chapter 3, begin with me in verse 14. Ephesians 3 and in verse 14. Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he may of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And then he brings it to a, to a conclusion. He says, Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And I can't think of anything better to say at the end of that than what Paul did. Amen. Paul says, I pray that you'll really grasp what this life in Christ is all about. It's a life of empowerment. It's a life where you are working hand in hand with the Lord. He says there in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, God's the one who's at work, right? But where's he working? Within us. How could any of what Paul prayed for occur without the members of the church at Ephesus or the members of the church here at Green Meadow recognizing our responsibility to step up and put hands and feet to that prayer. Some guy said, pray as though everything depends on God, but work as though everything depends on you. And I'll tell you, you and God, you make an unbeatable team. Together, you'll accomplish His will. When we pray for the salvation of others, our neighbors, our friends, maybe our family. What are we doing to bring about some results of that prayer? God expects us to do something about that so that prayer will come to fruition. When we pray for those, for the encouragement of those who are, are spiritually weak, what are we doing? Are we reaching out to them? Are we doing what we can to encourage them? When we pray for our own spiritual growth, it doesn't come with some silver bullet. God is not going to somehow cosmically infuse the knowledge of His will into you. He gives us His will in a way we can understand through language. And He expects us to get our nose into the book. Get into the book so that the book will get into you. God expects us to step up to our, our duty. In fact, prayer, no matter how beautifully it's worded, and we've heard some beautiful prayers, prayer does not absolve us of our duty. Prayer spurs us on to it. It motivates us. It drives us to bring about some, some result or fruition of that prayer. And when we pray for the strength that we're asking God for, really what we're praying for is... The fortitude to get up and do the work.
knowing that he's going to help us accomplish it. One man put it this way. He said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. When you go back and you look at this prayer that the apostles and other followers of Jesus voiced in the midst of opposition, how can we do any less? How can we not rely on the same power that they relied on? This is how early Christians prayed. And I believe it's how we should pray. How we can pray. Utterly dependent on the power of God. And if we do, God promises He will answer. Remember the verse that we looked at this morning, Nehemiah 2 and verse 20? The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we His servants will arise and build. We're building something here at San Angelo. I hope you're going to be part of it. I hope that you're going to lend whatever talents and abilities that you have to building up the work here in whatever way you can lend it. Maybe you're not a song leader. Maybe you're not a whatever. But there is something that you can do and only the way that you can do it. Join with your brethren and build together. Well, you've been patient this evening and I appreciate that very much. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing the song that's been selected for us. And as we consider that, don't forget the reason for an invitation song. It's about recognizing that, well, without the Lord, you don't have a chance. But He has made a way for you to be utterly saved. And before we leave this place this evening, you can come confessing that you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, making your conscious decision to turn away from sin, and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of of those sins, beginning a new life with real meaning and real purpose. And if you've already done those things and feel your purpose and focus beginning to wane, well, what I do know about this congregation is that they, they, they would love to help you. They want to pray with you and for you. And if we can do that, now's the time. Come, while we stand and sing.